Hi everybody, my name is Hannah and this is Pepper and Pine and today I want to share with you the books and resources we are using to put together our Islamic Empire main lesson block and this is going to cover the time period of around the late 500s, early 600s, all the way through to the Ottoman Empire in about the 1600s and it's going to cover primarily uh, the Arabian Peninsula and into uh modern day Iran and modern day Turkey, but it's also going to go into a little bit of North Africa. Now we do have other main lesson blocks that cover this time period in other parts of the world. Those those playlists are all down in the description box below. You can uh, tap on those links and see some of the other main lesson blocks that we have for these areas on the Silk Road and into Asia and beyond. So what I want to share with you today are a number of resources that are going to be part of this main lesson block, which is part of generally a Silk Road main lesson block, which came about when we were doing our Middle Ages unit several years ago, which is primarily on European history. And there were just a few notes and lessons about other parts of the world, but really not much. And what was disappointing was that while the European uh, countries or Europe in general was going through a bit of a dark ages period of time after the fall of the Roman Empire, it didn't really look at the rest of the world, which was thriving and in its golden era uh, throughout Asia and Arabia. And so I wanted to focus on that same time period, but on the flip side, seeing where where things were thriving and scientific discoveries were being made and people were doing well and uh, there were riches and and just the golden age. So we're going to um, not start in any particular order. I'm going to start with what's in front of me and explain to you as we go along how I'm putting together our units, uh, why I've chosen the books that we have chosen, and the hands-on activities that we want to include. So the first thing I want to show you actually is a hands-on activity. This is a DIY Build My World Dome of the Rock for Jerusalem or in Jerusalem. And this is... Uh, this is a really neat way to do a project like this in a very short space of time with no other materials than just what comes in this box, which is super lightweight. It actually weighs less than a book. So these pieces are these foam pieces that you assemble in order to make Dome of the Rock. These pieces can bend and break really easily and then once they're distorted it's really hard to assemble the project we've done projects like this in the past they are moderately challenging because sometimes they contain a lot of pieces and a lot of intricacies but for the most part you can assemble this in one sitting we do have other projects where you need to build it either you're casting the bricks or or rather pouring the plaster to make the bricks or you're gluing the bricks together maybe the bricks already come <clears throat> preformed and then you're gluing them in order to make the whole structure those ones take a lot longer and usually those ones are for older ages so this is a really nice one that you can put together fairly quickly and even for younger students we also have a biography on Muhammad this is the uh, final pr uh, prophet for um the for Muslims uh, I'm I'm speaking to an audience who may or may not know all of these details so when we're referring to the prophet we ask for peace and blessings upon him so that's something that we will either say in English or in Arabic sallallahu alaihi wasallam so you're generally not going to find his name without a saying blessings after it so this is uh a biography or we would call it a Sira book on his life. Now this is one that we started to read aloud as part of our lessons when we when we previously started our Silk Road unit, which was uh it's been growing for the last several years. This is not so far my favorite Sira resource. We've only gotten through to page nineteen before we just found it a little bit uh, uninspiring. However, a lot of people rave about this book, so I think we need to give it another go and get deeper into the book bef before we have more opinions about it. But overall, I've, I've heard good things about this. It's a great resource if you're looking to find out more about this person, this period of time in history, and where Islam kind of grew or where, you know, you know, the, the beginnings of, of Islam. So this is the, the biography that we're going to use, but I do have other ones that we have preferred. 
Science, Medicine, and Math in Early Islamic World. I believe this is a book that we picked up from the library bookstore, and I was super excited to find it because I hadn't actually seen this in my search while I was putting this unit together. I hadn't seen a book like this before. So I'm really excited to add this in. This is just the kind of material that I want where it's going to go over what was going on uh, as Islam spread, the different discoveries that we that were made in science medicine and math and uh and and uh, astronomy and just the other sciences so this is something that we're going to add into our unit i'm really super excited about this i can't tell you much about it i'm i'm wanting to read it as i'm telling you about it so this grade level probably is upper elementary junior high even uh even young high school level. I like these books for it giving you a nice overview of the subject area, but I don't generally find these to be super engaging books. I find that a historical fiction about this time period or maybe about a doctor is probably going to give you context for uh, for the information rather than it just being information outside of of the practical use or the story behind it. Uh, there are illustrations and photographs throughout this book. So I think overall it's going to be a pretty good resource. However, I can tell you more about it at the, during the review video for, for this unit. There are playlists for all of our history units. You can find most of them down in the description box below. And those playlists will include how we're putting together these units, the different projects that we're doing or any recipes that we are exploring for this unit. And then at the end, you'll find a review video that goes over these resources. A lot of these resources are ones that we person personally have acquired on our own, but there are some that we have used our educational funding to buy. And I really love sharing with you the, the books, the inside of the books, what grade level it is, how we like it, because we have the ability to get these resources. But if you are on a budget or you just are not going to cover <laughs> as many books as we're going to cover, then it's really helpful to get the ones that are really going to suit your needs. So I'll tell you more about this one in our review video, but this is just the kind of book that I like to include in our history units. The Hungry Coat. This is by the author Demi. I have other books in this series, or by this author rather, and we've enjoyed them. The illustrations, you're going to find similarities in all of the illustrations. They're not my favorite, but I think they're really well done, and I think they suit the these books really well. The, con uh, the text and the content are on the sides. This is a pattern that you'll see in a lot of a lot of these books. So it's kind of similar in this way. These are really lengthy picture books. in In the past, we have either read them through in one sitting or we have split them up over two days. On occasion, I have assigned this as independent reading for for my students, but for the most part, this is something that I'm going to read aloud. Uh, to my kids. Now, when we're putting together our units, I like to have resources that are going to work for multiple ages, multiple grades, multiple interests, multiple abilities, because we're generally not just homeschooling one grade level. And even if you are within that grade, you're going to find students that have varying abilities. So I like to have resources that can be mostly read aloud to my students. And if you're following more of a Waldorf approach where you're not going to be using your picture books as read alouds, you can use them as resources in order to get that information in order to present your lessons. I also find the illustrations to be great inspiration for your own drawings, either chalk drawings or illustrations for your main lesson books. So I do appreciate having picture books on hand because I'm not really artistically inclined naturally and I love using artwork as inspiration. So these books can be added into our opening activities really easily. Picture books lend themselves really well to an opening activity just to kind of uh, transition your students into that learning space or just invite them in. Maybe maybe they're doing something else and this is a great way to kind of encourage them into this uh, this subject area or the main lesson of the day. So I really like using picture books that way as well as hands-on projects and uh and games. I love using games in our opening activities as well. So we do have other picture books uh, for this unit, but not a lot. We have uh, primarily uh, resources that the teacher can use as 
uh, background information or as assigned reading for older students. These books here that I want to share with you are probably primarily for high school level, even college level. They are a lot more dense. So we have The Golden Age of Islam. This is by Maurice Lombard. And this is a really dense book that I would put this at high school or even college level. This is something that I would read aloud to my students, but not expect my really young students to participate. Uh, they, I might read this aloud while they're doing their other work. I, I'd be reading this aloud to an older student or the younger students might be doing some art or just playing, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask them to pay attention. However, they tend to pay attention really well when they're not expected to pay attention. So just a note that if they're playing nearby, they're probably listening really well. So this book is going to be something that I assign to my 14-year-old son to do some independent reading, primarily because I have so many resources. There's no way that I'm going to have time to read this aloud along with everything else. This is going to be quite dense, so I will ask him to do either oral or written narrations after every chapter. And also, because it is probably going to be new information that's really rich, I might have... Uh, have him tell me about it page by page, or I might read a little bit of it and, ha and have the information for us to have a discussion. It's just one of those things that can easily, it can go over your head if you're not really diving into it more deeply. Pathfinders, The Golden Age of Arabic Science. I was really excited about this book, and as I looked through it, I thought this is going to be way, way more complex and, uh, maybe even drier than I expected and definitely something for high school or college level. This is going to be something that you might use as your own reference material to put together your lessons. Again, this will be something that I assign to my son. He's a voracious reader when it comes to fiction books, but when it comes to nonfiction, it does take a little bit more effort to get through something like this. But because he's reading so many books that are below grade level, I really want to insist that he reads some of these texts that are more at his grade level, and he's um, 14. And so I'm excited to include some of these books for this main lesson block. Uh, Salahuddin, Hero of Science. I'm sorry, Hero of Islam. Uh, this is a book that my son has already started to read. This was a sign reading for him when we started this main lesson block. Uh, he didn't get far into this book. It was a little bit less engaging than he hoped. And this would be something that if I really wanted to continue reading or having him read, this would be something that I would include as a read aloud. Maybe uh, we, we tend to like to do our history units in the winter. It lends itself to a lot of cozy reading by the fireplace, and this might be something that I include as not quite a bedtime story, but something that's after our school day. So this is another one that uh, I would put at, at definitely uh, junior high, if not high school and even college level. I have another book that is a signed reading. This is Khalid bin al-Walid. This is Sword of Allah. These are biographies that are also fairly dense. This was recommended to me by a friend of mine whose son read it, and I believe she read it too, and ha was just raving about it, just said it was so well done. So I was really excited to add this in. I started reading this myself, didn't get too far into the book, and found it to be really engaging. Uh, I know my... Uh, this is, I, I actually got into the book, <laughs> not just the preface. So I, I found this to be a really engaging read. I was super excited about it and then got distracted with other things, didn't finish reading this book. But this is something that I could easily assign to my son and I could expect that he would get it done pretty easily. But at the same time, since this is something that I, I'm really finding interesting, I would try to incorporate it as a read aloud so that all of my children could benefit from from this book. But overall, uh, I'm, I am I might put this as one of the first books that he reads, be, while the motivation and inspiration for the main lesson block is still heightened. By the time we get a few weeks into our main lesson block, a lot of our, our enthusiasm has kind of waned and our interest is starting to kind of go away. And we've done a lot of the new fun learning. And now whatever work we haven't included into our main lesson book, we're starting to need to do, we, we need to do that. We need to do the illustrations and the writing. And we just start to get a little bit fatigued with the main lesson block. So if whatever I would just, for me, I tend to try to make it heavy in the beginning, especially with the content that might be a little more difficult to get through, just so that we have a little bit more flexibility as we move on with our unit. 
All right, let me bring in a few more resources here to share with you. We have multiple main lesson blocks on this time period and throughout this region. So we, we're going to have a number of biographies that are going to work well for this unit, but we also have other main lesson blocks that I encourage you to look into because we have one on Ibn Battuta and that's going to be another fantastic look at North Africa and the Asian and Islamic world at that time in the, about the 1300s. And Salah Hedin is another one. Uh, this is a, a similar book, but a much easier read. And this is also going to be that same time period around the 13, 12, 1200s, or maybe even earlier. Hold on, because I think it's even earlier than that, maybe even the 1100s. So we have we have a variety of resources from uh, suitable for young elementary all the way up until college for this particular unit. And generally with my units, we don't have so many resources that are for high school and college. So this is one exception to the units where we're going to have a lot more heavier material. So this is going to balance out some of that heavier material with something that's going to be a little bit easier to read. It's going to be a great addition to have this before we do the heavier book on Sahedin. That way we have a already an interest and an understanding and a familiarity before we get into some of the heavier books. So this one is Sahedin and the, Cru uh, the Crusades. All right, so the next book is a historical fiction. I'm not really interested in including this book into this unit, but I did want to share it with you because it was in our homeschool library. It's called The Bedouin's Gazelle, uh, Bound by Tradition, Torn by Love. This is not something that appeals to me at all. I do not appreciate historical fiction that include situations that are going to be contradictory to the religion. And just by the look of this cover and the title, I feel like that could be something thing that's included in this book. And if that's the case, I wouldn't want to read it at all. I don't mind historical fiction, uh, even things that are on the fringes of what might be acceptable in our religion. But when it comes to a text that includes characters who are Muslim, I, I absolutely reject them doing things that are not in line with the religion. I don't appreciate that for my for for my fiction, for my novels, for my children to read. I don't feel like those are good role models. I don't feel like those are good examples to see someone strain from the religion, even if it ends up like a happy ending in the end. I don't feel like those are quality books for my children to have. So chances are I'm not going to be using this book. I did want to share it with you and share my opinions about historical fiction that are like this. However, having not read this book, I could be completely wrong about the content. So if you have and you have some information that you want to share with me, please do so. Uh, the comment section is usually rich with additional resources that viewers uh, share. So please participate if you, if you wish by sharing your thoughts or any other resources that you have opinions about or that you want to share that I have not included. Uh, the comment section is just the place to do that. Okay, we have another book that I'm a little bit hesitant, hesitant to share. It's 1001 Arabian Nights. This book we have already read and we have now read for the second time. We're up nearly to finished with the book for the second time around. My kids actually really like this book a lot. The stories themselves are interesting and engaging, but the beginning of the book, the whole reason why we, you, you know, have this book and, and not really, this is fiction, but the whole reason why we have this book is that the Sultan is killing his wife every morning. So she's only a wife for one day or one night rather and then the following day he has another wedding to another maiden and the that whole concept is completely uh just not allowed like you, this this not okay and so to have that as the basis of the story doesn't uh like it, I I just have a problem with it I know this is fiction I know this this isn't like that's not the point uh even the the stories themselves have islam kind of mixed in or maybe some traditions mixed in and being a muslim i can easily go through this and comment on on what's being said and what's being written but if you're not and you're just reading this as oh this is what muslims believe or this is what people do then that's a real problem for me because this doesn't paint an accurate picture so you you can see that you have you'll have references to muslims or islam you have allah here written here uh, and 
And so I would tread lightly for this resource. I do not recommend it. If you have it and you're, you're curious, that's great. Go ahead and, and enjoy it, but read it with, with an open mind to understand that this is not, um, these are not Islamic rules at all. Uh, this is a work of fiction, even though there may be Muslim characters. So if you can go into it understanding that, then I think that's fine. What's interesting, though, I tend to include a lot of folk tales, folklore, legends, fairy tales, those kinds of things into our main lesson blocks in order to understand the culture and the people. And this is this is one such reference that you could use to, in theory, understand the people of the time or the Muslims of the time or maybe uh, in, in Persia at the time. But really, it's not a fair and accurate depiction of them. And so I'm hesitant to I'm, I'm just it's just not. Uh, so when you read this, you might get some culture. But then it's also mixed in with a lot of falsehoods. So that's something that you want to be mindful of. Uh, daily life in the Islamic golden age. I'm really excited about this book. I'm hoping that it's accurate and, uh, and brings, brings some level of understanding and familiarity with what life is like or was like at that time for Muslims and about the religion in general. Being a Muslim, again, it's really easy for me to pick out things or inaccuracies and to be able to talk about them with my children. Uh, in the review video, I will try to uh, point out the resources that had some issues that maybe you want to double check on or maybe just not include in your main lesson block. Right now, I'm sharing everything that I have. There could be some really valuable resources. And at the same time, there could be things that are really not good additions. So I'm, I'm apologize ahead of time for sharing all of these things without knowing all of the details about them. This is how we put together our units. I collect all of these resources. We start to break them down and decide how we're going to read them, what, what resources are going to be part of our opening activities which resources I'm going to do as assigned reading, which ones I'm going to read aloud, how many days we want to take for uh, reading these materials aloud. And then we just have a priority list. If we start to read something and it's just really not doing it for us, we will put it aside and uh, take one of the other resources. Okay, so this is um, a picture book that I have high hopes for. So let's see how, how it works out. The next book I want to show you is called The Genius of Islam, How Muslims Made the Modern World. In the past, we have gone to museum exhibits on the inventions of the Muslims or the Islamic world or the Muslim world at the time uh, of like, say, 800s to about the 1400s, uh, the scientific discoveries that were made. And we've really enjoyed those museum ex uh, expeditions, uh, ex exhibitions. <laughs> And this book kind of reminds me of that. There are, there are others. I think there's 1001, uh, in Islamic invent, not Islamic inventions. I forgot the title, but there are other books that are like this. This one is a really simple, beautifully done overview that isn't going to, uh, that isn't going to be as dense as some of the other books that we have. And it, or I'm sorry, some of the other books that are available on the different inventions of that the Muslim Muslim scientists have made. I find this to be just the right amount of, of information and it's nicely illustrated and it gives like, for me, it gives me some good ideas on what we could do for some of our projects. So I, I do appreciate this book quite a bit. Ibn Sina, A Concise Life. I do not know much about Ibn Sina and I had added this book into our, our unit and before we got a chance to to use it in our unit, I was able to read it and I, I liked it. I did find it really interesting. I thought it was a great biography, but there are some aspects about his life and the choices that he made that are not in line with Islam. And again, as a Muslim, I can pick those out pretty easily, but if you're not, you may think that everything he did was in line with Islam. And I just want to point out that it wasn't as far as, you know, my opinion and my understanding, it wasn't. So this was, this was a really, really interesting read because it, it illuminated the practical side of what it was like to live under Islamic rule because the, 
every region was was governed by a governor, and while the rules are are supposed to be universal and the same, there are different flavors depending on where these governors were, or maybe their background, or maybe their interpretation of the law. So each one was a little bit different, or say what school of thought they they believed in, uh, and so there, there's a little bit of a different. Uh, feel for all of these different regions. And so reading this kind of gave me insight on what it was like to, to live in that region. And I, I apologize. I don't remember what city he lived in, but he did have to move around depending on which governor was going to be favorable for the kind of research that he was doing. Khadija, mother of history's greatest nation. I was really hesitant to include this book because this is my understanding and opinion is that it's somewhat of a historical fiction based on Khadija, who was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's wife. But I have heard really, really great reviews of this book, and so we decided to add it in. It's a really easy read. This is something that you could have your students read on their own, but this is something that I'm going to be reading aloud, especially for my nine-year-old daughter. I think that she'll really enjoy this book. One thing that we are in short supply of are biographies on the women, uh, um, either Muslim scholars or uh, just women in Islam, for me at least, I find that they are hard to come by and it may be because I just haven't researched it enough and the ones on the, say, the male scientist or the male scholars are just easier to come by, but I think it's really important to balance it out with a lot of the female scholars and the uh, female historians and female doctors and, and all the, the things that, that the women did. It's really important that we bring that in. And not just that they had these professions, but also that they were, they were mothers or they were wives or they were daughters. They were women. They were, they, they were, they wore many different hats. I don't want to just say, let's look at the, the scholars or let's look at the, uh, the scientists. Let's look at all of them so that we get a really nice holistic picture of what life was like and what these women did. I have one book here that I'm I'm hesitant to share because I did not want to purchase this book. This is Muhammad by Demi. And the reason why is that even the cover I find offensive. We do not depict the prophet in any way. We don't even depict other uh, other images. And so having I'm just hesitant to have this, but I did want to share it with you. We did pick this up secondhand. I do want to share this with you because I wanted to read it so that I could tell you about it and, and as a Muslim, let you know, are there things that are accurate or are there misunderstandings or are there things that are just blatantly not true? And the first thing is the depictions. We do not do this. And so to have a book like this personally for me is a little bit offensive. Uh, you may have a different opinion as, even as a Muslim, you may have a different opinion or if you're not Muslim, you may not have uh, you may not see it the same way that we do. I do want to read the information so that I can accurately tell you in the review video how this book is, uh, as far as how accurate it is. Uh, this is a book that if I was reading this aloud to my children, I would pre-read it first. And then the second thing is that I would just read it without them seeing the pictures because I don't uh, appreciate the illustrations for this book. I have, uh, let me share with you these last three books over here, and then I have a few more resources that I want to share with you. Um, Ibn Haytham, this is by National Geographic Kids, The Man Who Discovered How We See. I really, really like this book. It is super simple, easy to read, uh, nicely illustrated, great photographs. The only thing is that it's written for like a really young student. So this says level three. And while I appreciate this for young students who want to read this on their own, the reason why I don't like books that are intended for really young readers is usually either the information is dumbed down or the sentence structure is really basic or the words themselves, the vocabulary isn't rich so that it can be suitable for a really young student. And I don't really care for that too much. I'd rather read aloud something that's of higher caliber that my younger students can understand even if they're not capable of reading it. But I still wanted to include this book primarily because I find it hard to find all the resources that I want for some of these units that are not as common and popular. And so I, whenever I found anything that worked, I went ahead and got it. And you'll be able to see how things fare by the end of this 
unit because not everything is going to work well. And we're not going to like everything. And I want to share with you the things that were really great, that we love, that we want to use again, and the ones that we didn't care for too much. So I'm excited to share how this one works out. Destination Middle Ages, your guide to the Islamic Golden Age. Now, this is something that you would probably include in a Middle Ages unit study that could then talk about other areas of the world. We're using this... Uh, this is going to be at the same time period, but we're using this, of course, for this unit. But I think that this would be a really great resource if you just need a little bit to explore the Islamic Empire while you're doing your Middle Ages unit. These are the kind of books that you can really easily find at the at your local library, in my opinion. Uh, these aren't the kind that maybe you always want to include in your home library, especially because these are the kinds of books that the library uh, cycles through pretty quickly and gets newer publications fairly often in my opinion uh either either there are new authors or new information even though it's a history book there are new discoveries new uh things that are being translated or archaeologists are, are unearthing new things so it's and also you, when you're looking at books like this you're getting the popular cultural opinions mixed in to the book. So whatever was was popular at the time from a writer's perspective, those ideas naturally seep into the book. So if you read something from, say, a 100 years ago, you're going to see a, a certain flavor that you're like, oh, this, you can tell that it's written at this time where these kinds of ideas and beliefs were popular. You see that in the biases that come through in very simple things. And even in what people find beautiful or ugly, that's that is, I find, to be an opinion. It's really hot. I mean, it would be an incredibly dry book if you were just fact-based and you didn't have any of your opinions. However, sometimes as you go through these books, especially really old ones, some of those cultural ideas do seep into the writing. So this uh, for, for this book, one thing that I noticed that I don't particularly like are a lot of these smaller captions within a book. I prefer just to have the the text and the illustrations. I find this chaotic for me personally. I know some people really like this. They they might just want a couple of things that they want to read and then move on. Uh, something else about this book that I'm guessing at that I can't say for sure is that you could probably open this up on any two-page spread, read it, and not really have to know what came before or what's going to follow. So if you just wanted to know about one particular subject area, Islamic learning or friends and enemies, Islamic rulers, you could probably read this, get some information on this without having to read the whole book. So this is one of those books that don't really read like a narrative and that's okay. This is probably a little bit more of a drier resource. And when we have these resources, I use them sparingly or in between other resources that are a little bit more lively. 16th Century Mosque. This is a book that we've had for a while. It's really beautifully illustrated, a little bit dated on the illustrations. However, I still really enjoy it. It goes through uh, different mosques, uh, how they were built, uh, just some of the mannerisms for Muslims, the call to prayer, uh, what the minarets were used for, and other um, other things regarding the building of the masjid, or the mosque, rather. So uh, we ha either it's a been a long time since I've read this book or I'll have to tell you about it at the during the review video because I, I can't tell you much more about this book except that it's a really beautiful resource and a really lovely addition to this or just to a, a unit on architecture architecture uh, or uh, the Middle Ages. I have uh, a few more resources to share with you. Let me just pull them all out. They're not in any particular order, so I apologize for not having us start with our opening activities, moving into games and projects. I only have a few projects set up for this particular unit. We have some fabric dyeing that we want to do, and we built a sandstone mosque as part of our Africa unit that will be included with with these resources, as well as a Kaaba. We, we made a Kaaba using some uh, silicon molds that we had in a previous kit and some plaster, and we, we, we built that. So those were just a few of the projects that we had intended for this particular unit. We're actually 
kind of shy on the projects. We don't have that many. We do have a ton of books uh, and resources to read. And our games are ones that we already have within our homeschool. They are Islamic games that we like to play. I haven't included them here, but they are ones that we would be using as part of our opening activities that are primarily designed for a Muslim audience. And I'm trying to keep these resources available for everyone, whether you're Muslim or not. And that's why some of the some of the things that we would have, they are primarily for a Muslim family. So we have like the 99 names of Allah matching game. We have a Quran challenge and Hadith challenge. And those are things that if you are a Muslim family, you probably already are familiar with some of those games and uh, additional projects. Okay, so let me start with this book. Uh, this one's by uh, Roger uh, Crawley. This is 1453. We bought this book from a retailer, Rainbow Resource, and Rainbow Resource uh, has a lot of Christian books, and uh, they cater to a Christian audience and a homeschool audience, but a lot of their resources are going to appeal to a Christian audience. So I was really concerned about this book because this is the fall of Constantinople, the rise of Islam. This is the beginning of Istanbul. And I was concerned about this book. This had been on my mind to add to our resources for a while. And I was a little bit concerned about it. So we, since, since our Silk Road Islamic unit, uh, Africa unit has been revisited year after year for the past few years now because it keeps growing and expanding i've actually already read this book aloud to my children and it was fabulous it was a really dense read we did it as a read aloud so it was really dense and i don't think that my son would have enjoyed reading this on his own so we read this aloud there were some parts that were really laborious to get through but overall it was amazing and i was really surprised at how neutral the author was there are some parts that historically i don't know are if they are accurate or not because they do contradict with the teachings of islam so there are some parts where either people did things that they weren't supposed to do them or the references historically have been altered or they're they're not accurate or they're not strong resources so for that part i i, I don't know but as far as the author i felt personally that it was fairly neutral, n not biased. I felt like the resources were balanced on both sides. I felt like it was a really good view of the fall of Constantinople. However, it still feels like it was written from, n not from a Muslim perspective. I'll say it that way. Not that it was written from a Christian perspective, but not like it was written from um, the perspective that the Muslims weren't like the enemies, weren't the conquerors. So that's, I don't know if that's uh, a great way to describe it, but as, as a Muslim reading this, I really enjoyed it thoroughly. I found that it was really well written. It was really captivating. It read like a movie. Like it felt like every chapter kept building and building and building and building and building. And you kept thinking, when is it going to fall? Like when is Constantinople going to fall? Like you, you kept having these, um, these chapters that were so lengthy and so detailed and, and would occasionally take you back in time and circle back to the present really well done, but definitely high school or college level definitely would do it as a read aloud if you have younger children. And, um, I was just really impressed with it. Uh, this is a textbook primarily for Muslim students. This is on the Khilafa Rashida, uh, Rashida. This is going to be the first uh, rulers after the prophet. And this would be something that I would add in as a personal reference and education, but less something that would be used by a general audience. I have other books that can be used uh, if you're looking for references for that time period. This is a, this is a text for uh, by Muslims for Muslims primarily, in my opinion. On a Medieval Day, Story Voyages Around the World. This one we used for our Middle Ages unit, which is primarily European-centered. But this book actually had stories from around the world during the Middle Ages period. So from 700 to about 1395. And it was from all over the world. So there is a section here. Uh, for Baghdad during the Islamic Empire, nine, uh, during the year 905. And so that's why I 
have this book out to share with you because that's the story that we're going to read um, for this unit. And that's why we have this book. Aramco World, there are a few articles in uh, Aramco World that have suited some of our history units for this time period, this location. So we had one for Ibn Battuta, another one for Marco Polo, and this one is on the history of paper. And so I'm not sure that we'll, we're going to include this particular article into our unit, but it does fit really well. But because we have so many resources, we may or may not use it. But I wanted to share this with you. I wouldn't say run out and, and find this one. This is from May, June, 1999. So it may be a real challenge to to find something like this. However, since we had it, I wanted to share that we are adding it in. Camels. <laughs> We're going to spend a little time reading this book on camels. They are amazing desert animals, and we have had this book for some of our other units, and so I wanted to share it here as well, even though it's a little bit different from the theme of this unit so far. I think this might be a little bit more well-suited for our Silk Road unit, which I did share it with that unit as well, since there's a lot more about the caravans and trade routes and how camels were used, but I wanted to share it along with this unit as well. Uh, so we I have a few books here that I want to share with you. These are on the four rulers, uh, similar to the book that I said was by Muslims for Muslims. I want to share with you these books, but I also want to tell you that we have some more books coming on these same uh individuals they are biographies but they are new books that are readily available there are from siraj bookstore i'm going to leave uh that information down in the description box below we haven't received those books yet i am super excited to get them and there is a whole series on different biographies during the prophet sallallahu time and i wanted to include those but they're not here yet so in the meantime i want to share some of the books that we have already in our library i don't recommend you running out to find these because these are vintage and they may be hard to come by. These were originally published in 1958 with these being reprinted in 1975 and 1976. So these are about 45 years old at this time. And these are ones that have been in our homeschool library for so many years. And I'm, I'm going to add these in and I, I am eager to read them and, and just you know, see how they compare to some of the newer texts. They are history biographies, and so I imagine that the information is going to be the same. It just may be uh, how they're written, how engaging they are, the the vocabulary that's used, and so that's just going to be something that's interesting to see. They are really delicate books. These are things that I will probably read aloud to the children rather than them uh reading them just because they feel like they're about to fall apart. Uh, don't forget to check out the blog post that accompanies this video. You're going to find more information and pictures and details on the resources that we're using. That link is down in the description box below. You can tap on the screen right now and check out some of the video playlists that we have on our different history units. They're going to include the tutorials that we're doing for each of these units. And if you want to see how our homeschool is progressing on a daily basis, you can find me on Instagram at Pepper and Pine.